Memories fade. Welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you all again. If you'd like to stand as we worship the Lord, please feel free to do so. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. That is from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Please be seated. Everybody, please welcome Nick LaPrell. Good morning. 
morning, everybody. Oh, there it is. Great to see you as always. Let's see if I can remember my order of to do here. Got that. Well, it's great to see you all here this morning. Um, I had so much fun last time, really appreciate being here, and you know, I absolutely love doing this, but figured we'd change things up just a little bit. I usually like to go through a nice big chunk of scripture and break it down and just really stick in that word. We're gonna have plenty of scripture today, but I wanted to really kinda show you what my process is for breaking it down and understanding it, because we're expected to understand scripture, and that can be kinda hard. There's uh, a lot there, there's a lot of words and culture and everything that kind of go into it, and it can be a little bit difficult. Some people spend their entire lives going through and trying to understand. I'm talking about people with doctorate degrees that go through course after course and seminary and, and a lot of education going into understanding the original languages, the original intents, the culture, the history of the time. And that's really important and that's really hard for those of us that don't have the time and resources to go and do that, myself included. But faith does not want you to turn your brain off. You're not expected to just blindly follow God. He's a reasonable God. He's not expecting you to just turn logic off and, and focus in on him regardless of everything else. Scripture is reasonable. So I wanted to take you through some of the process and where we see that reason in Scripture. Scripture itself encourages reasoning and understanding. My favorite verse, one of my absolute favorite verses is in Isaiah 1.18. It says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, a lot of people look to this scripture right here and, and you see the, the message of salvation in there and that's a wonderful thing, but I actually like this for a slightly different reason, and that's the beginning, where he says, let us reason together. For me, where I needed the Lord to meet me was that reasoning. That was where I was focused, and, and this is one of the ways that he did that, is showed me through his word, it's reasonable. It's, there's nothing crazy in here. He's a reasonable God. He's not asking for blind faith. He's not saying, just believe. He's saying, I'm reasonable. And in here, he's inviting us to have a relationship with him specifically with his children, that can reason with him. He's not giving them anything difficult. He's not giving them anything just to be mean or just to be a particular way. Everything is reasonable. Scripture says uh, God's followers reasoned with people. In Acts uh, 19, specifically 8 through 10, uh, it describes Paul's work at Ephesus. Uh, it says, the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some of them were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil on the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul didn't come in there and force a conversion. He didn't come in there and say, you'll get these warm, fuzzy feelings if you convert. He didn't come in there and try to trick them into it. He reasoned. Paul and his people went through the scriptures. They went through verse by verse and showed how this points to Jesus. He didn't just expect blind faith. He went out and he reasoned with the people. But reasoning wasn't just limited to people like Paul. 2 Timothy 2.15-7 through 7 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. A good, godly follower sees how to follow the scripture. There are two things here that jump out right at me. It says, rightly dividing the word. And that's just really understanding how it goes together. Rightly dividing the word is understanding and reasoning through the word of God. And it says, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they increase to more ungodliness. You know what an idle babbling is? You ever see some of those, uh, and you can't stereotype all of these posters, but some of those, uh, you know, they've got a really nice, beautiful sunset, and it says something really, really, really deep, but some of them, when you think about that, it's, it's kind of nonsensical. 
you know, it's, it's just kind of idling or stating the obvious or, you know, something, it doesn't really have a whole lot of value. And so what he's saying is be careful of somebody that stands up and speaks really well and speaks really elegant, but doesn't act. This is for all of us. We're not necessarily all meant to go out and preach the way Paul preach, but when we crack open our scripture, we should be able to read through there, and we should be able to rightly divide that word. In Acts 17.10, we also see that reason is part of accepting the truth of scripture. It says, uh, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So how did the Bereans respond to Paul coming out there? Paul was doing his part. He was reasoning through the scripture, but they still had a job to do as well. They reasoned through the scriptures. They checked the scriptures. They searched the scriptures. Paul says that scripture says this. Does it really? Is Paul understanding correctly? And they go through there and they find that and make sure Paul's got the context right, that he's got the true meaning, that they, that they agree with what he's saying that scripture says. They could have taken it by blind faith and said, well, you know, Paul's a really respectable guy. He's real powerful. He's really smart. He's accomplishing a lot of work. You know, if he says this, I'm sure it's true. And they could have been done. But Paul was also a man. Paul was subject to mistake. They searched the scriptures daily. They didn't blindly believe whatever Paul preached. They compared scripture and they reasoned it out. So this is all really important for us to do as well. And I'm up here, I'm human, and I'm going to make mistakes. I pray every time that the Lord would make sure that those are minimal, that nobody catches those, and we can not have me get in the way of God's word, because that's what we're trying to do up here. But it doesn't matter how well-respected the teacher is, how popular they are, how great they are. Our job is to check it in Scripture. When Pastor Steve comes up here himself and says, the Bible says this, and you, you don't remember that, go find it. He could be wrong. He's usually pretty accurate. He's a great teacher. But our duty is to check that and to make sure because we're ultimately the ones responsible for understanding, right? So let's pause for a moment. Um, I think I've uh, established how important it is for us to understand the Word of God and to reason through it and to really get the verses at So I, uh, I found this, uh, this saying here. You've seen it. It's on your, your church bulletins. It's one of, uh, one of my favorites. It's not directly from Scripture, but it summarizes uh, several scriptural verses. Um, I, I looked it up, and I tried to pinpoint the origins, um, thinking that you know, I'd find a nice name in a region, and I found several of them. Um, and nobody seems to agree where this came from. Uh, there are four or five different possibilities and different people that have this attributed to them, but needless to say, they, they got it from scriptural basis, and, uh, and it's pretty good for what it is. It says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, love. All of the things that are essential, what is that? Knowing that Christ is our Savior, knowing that he died for our sins, that he resurrected, that he is God. These are essential things. That's what makes us Christian. In the non-essentials, liberty. You should only be listening to Christian music. Say that, right? Let's have some liberty there. You can, you can worship God that way. I'll worship God my way. Some of the things where scripture is maybe a little silent or not completely focused in on, and, and we could both be right or we could both be wrong, let's show liberty. We don't want those things to divide the body of Christ. So when we're going through there and we're doing our reasoning through scripture, sometimes the Spirit will speak to us in how that scripture is to work in our lives, and that Spirit will speak to us various different things that maybe some of it's just for us, and maybe some of it is just flat out that we, we misunderstood. We need to be careful not to be divisive about what we know to be the truth. And here's where it all sums up. In all things love, what's important is that love behind it. It's more important to be loving than to be able to speak out the truth at all times. In fact, I think uh, 1 Corinthians 13 uh, he tells us exactly this. He says, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
and though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. What Paul is saying right here is you can be the most intelligent theologian the earth has ever known, and if you are not speaking God's word in love, it's going to be ineffective. So as we go through and figure out how we rightly divide the word and what that means, bear in mind that when we come across our findings, we need to be loving towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. We could talk all morning about unity, liberty, how it all works together, uh, but I want to focus again on how it is that we search the scriptures daily, how we seek that truth, and, and we'll just make sure that that truth manifests in us in love. So I want to make a list. Lists are easy to remember. They're nice and friendly. Um, my disclaimer is that this list comes just from me. It's not coming from any sort of a, a theological class or any um, you know, well-respected program and whatnot. These are some of the things that I've learned that are important to me in understanding uh, the word of the Lord, so take it with that in mind. But this is the process that I, uh, I like to, to go through. Five items. First step to understanding the Bible is to receive direction from the Spirit. Lost my place. There it is. Start your study time in prayer. Start your devotion time in prayer. When you're speaking the word to somebody else, when you're teaching them about the Lord, start it in prayer because this all comes from the Spirit first and foremost. God's word is truth. It's from the Spirit who speaks it to us. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. We have our own understanding, we have our set of logic, but ultimately all of the real, true knowledge that is indisputable comes from God. And so we need to bear that in mind when we're about to look into it. If you want to know what's true, what's false, ask the one who knows everything. Ask God. Truth and understanding comes from God, so ask him for it. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, He things we also speak not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We can't do it alone. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand the Word of God and the intention there. And we have to start from there. We can see Paul started from there as well. If, if you're speaking the truth, it's because God is allowing you and showing you the truth to speak, nothing else. So with that in mind, because that frames up everything that we do when we're searching the scriptures, the second step to understanding the Bible. Context, context, context. So in real estate... Location is king. They say location, location, location. Everything is there. That's where all the importance is. If you've got the wrong location, you don't make any money. You lose money. But in scripture, context is king. That helps us to understand it. Context is how we communicate. Um, really good example using uh, some, some slightly new modern vernacular that uh, apparently I'm already a little bit too old to use. But uh, you hear the phrase, he's sick. Without context, you don't have any meaning. Now, each of us might have an interpretation of what that means. And depending on our age groups, we probably all disagree on some of what that means. So, he's sick. One interpretation is he stepped in a steaming pile of unknown goo with a rank smell. He's sick. He's gross. And that makes sense, right? Same word. Same word, different context. He's pale, sweaty, dazed, and coughing. He's sick. Don't shake his hand. Don't get near him because he's probably contagious. Right? Same word, two different contexts now, right? There's even a third one. And this one, you know, I, I don't know. I've never used before. I think it's a little too new for me. He put on a winged suit and flew down the side of a, the side of a mountain at 120 miles an hour. If any of you have ever seen that on YouTube, it's absolutely amazing. These crazy guys just flying through the air on a, on a wing suit. And they say, he's sick. The younger kids will say that to me, and he's pretty amazing. That guy is really cool. So as you can see, 
you take a single word, you take it out of context, and you start to lose meaning unless you know what's going on around that word. And each of those cases, we can kind of get the idea of what that word actually means by looking through the context. That's why it's so important in scripture. The Bible spans thousands of years, many authors, contains genealogy, history, philosophy, poetry, and prophecy. To understand it, you have to understand the context. Out of context, how do we know whether this is prophecy or poetry or history? Did this really happen or is this actually painting a picture in some poetic way? We need to understand the context of the scripture that we're studying because it does all of those things the same way that our words now have different meanings in different contexts. So this is, this is the one I want to focus on a lot because context is so important. It's the who, what, when, where, and why of the context of scripture. So let's take a, an easy example from, uh, from the last time I was up here. Uh, we went over some really difficult scripture. It said, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, out of Ephesians 5.22. I've known that people like to take that piece of scripture, isolate it, and throw that up there and, and use that, and you're supposed to submit to me, the husband, and then leave it at that. Uh, there's some missing context there because if we keep reading, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. All right, it, it kind of frames things up a little bit more, so now there's some responsibilities on that, uh, that guy that's trying to throw that uh, scripture out there and, and get some authority but we're still missing a little bit more. When we keep reading in the context in the same exact section later on, it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The context makes all the difference in there because if you take that piece of scripture, which is the true word of God, and you isolate it from everything else, it can mean something very different and it can be used in a very different way. So when you're watching a TV show, around there, because it might sound right, and it might sound good, and make a lot of sense, but you get into the context, and you might see, well, Scripture's not actually saying that. It doesn't make their conclusion wrong, but it just means that that piece of Scripture doesn't necessarily support that conclusion. That's really important, because when we're speaking the Word of God, we want to speak the Word of God, not our own. And if you make Scripture mean something it doesn't really mean, that's a dangerous place to be. I, I definitely wouldn't want to be there. So always check, at least before and after, look for the context. So let's do another one and go a little bit deeper, because that was a really easy one. You know, if you just simply read the whole section there, you, you get it. Um, I want to go through uh, one we have from Matthew 5.39. It says, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Makes sense. We've all heard this. We've uh, been through it a few times. Uh, it's the turn the other cheek verse, all right? So let's start breaking it down. Who? Who is speaking and who are they speaking to? Jesus is speaking. If you have uh, some of the Bibles, you'll see that it's in red letters. They make that real easy to figure out when Jesus is speaking. And that tells us that there's a pretty good amount of authority uh, in it. This is something that Jesus is saying. Jesus says he did, did nothing without his father. He's doing everything only for his father. So if he's speaking it, it's coming directly from God. This is really important. It carries a lot of weight to it. He's speaking to the multitudes from many backgrounds. Um, that lets us know it's not a specific commandment to just his followers or just disciples or just the Jews or just the people of the town of fill in the blanks. This was a, a big number of people, various different backgrounds, both geologically and, and religiously. They had different, uh, different styles, different upbringings and whatnot, and he's speaking to all of them. So that's important. That means that we can probably take what he's saying and pretty well soundly apply it to us. This was very public. Um, how do we know he's speaking to people from different backgrounds? Context. When you take a look in chapter 4, 25, it tells us various different multitudes. Uh, it says, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So we take our, our context into account. We can solve the who, which is really important. It's context. Where? He's on a mountain, makes it easier for people to hear him. You're up, uh, up high, got the right time of day, the right, uh, right weather out. Your voice can project. They, don't, they didn't need any of these newfangled speakers and wireless microphones back then. Jesus could speak in the right setting, in the right way, and people much larger than our congregation could hear him. And so that's why up on that, uh, that mountaintop. 
This was a public setting. Uh, we could guess that Jesus was, uh, what he was saying was meant to be shared, uh, not meant just for that select group of people. He was in a, a very public area and he's speaking a word there. So that's also important. What? Turn the other cheek. It says, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. A lot of people have taken this to mean that uh, you shouldn't stand up to evil, that you should allow people to walk all over you. If somebody hits you or abuses you or threatens your life, you're to sit there and take it. A lot of people uh, went down the route of conscientious object objectors, the people that uh, would decide not to fight a war, even a just war, where we're protecting our own country because they felt that that meant that they would be and take evil. That's what this is, uh, has, has been made to mean. So that's what we want to take a look at. And we have when. This is really important where it starts to come into, in, into play here. Um, at the time and the location, a slap across the cheek wasn't me trying to physically harm you. It was me insulting you. It's like calling you a name or extending a, a particular finger in your direction as our co modern culture would be. It's the same sort of a thing. It was a, a vulgar uh, hit to somebody um, to really just get them to, to upset them, not necessarily to physically harm them. Of course, there's a sting that goes with it. So as we clear things up, we see one of two possibilities. Jesus might have been talking about taking a beating without standing up to him, uh, not resisting an evil person. Uh, but he also could have been saying, if somebody insults you, even though you're justified to respond to that insult, just let it go. Why? Why is Jesus saying this? And this is where context starts to come into play. What was he trying to express? Well, the context of the surrounding verses is to love your enemies. The context of the chapter, this was the Sermon on the Mount. And this is where uh, a lot of theologians say that uh, this, sum, this, this particular part of scripture is summed up that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. It's what you've got going on in your heart, not so much the actions and what's the motivation for things. The context of scripture, Jesus resisted evil. He overturned the tables at the temple. He stands up to evil. So that's in conflict if he says that we are to resist evil and then says, do not resist an evil person. That first idea of just putting your arms down, not hitting back, not protecting yourself or your family when in danger, doesn't fly too well because it doesn't make sense in the context of who Jesus was and what he taught. What I think flies a is that when somebody insults you, let it go. That sounds like Jesus. That sounds an awful lot like Jesus, right? So this is some of the, the contextual principles we want to start to apply. Now again, apply your own. You've got to search this out for yourself. Look through the scripture. Who is Jesus? Does, does, this, does this make sense? Does this, is this who Jesus was? Or could I be off? You know, by all means, look through it. So it brings us to the third step in understanding the Bible. Scripture is the final authority. It's the ultimate authority above everything else. When something is in conflict with the Bible, when you have the Bible says this and then so-and-so guru says that, and the two don't make sense because they, they, they oppose each other, Scripture is always right. Every single time. R.C. Sprawl wrote a, a really good devotional on the topic uh, of the inerrancy of the Bible. Um, he starts off, uh, with uh, 2 Timothy. It says, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture itself says that scripture is valid. It starts first. It is the ultimate authority. Um, at the end of his uh, devotional, he sums it up really well. He says, we can read... so that we can know him and his will, doing what we are called to do without fear. Consider your commitment level. Could it be enhanced by a stronger affirmation of the trustworthiness of scripture? Scripture is always true. Everything else that conflicts is not. Can't say it enough. And if we have a really good understanding that scripture is always true, what we'll find out is when we find something that 
we come across in Scripture, it doesn't make sense. It's a me problem. Why do I not think that that's true? Am I interpreting the Scripture wrong? Because that's always a possibility. Maybe I'm reading it and I think it's saying one thing when it's actually saying another. Or have I been taught somewhere else and that somewhere else is flat out wrong? It happens a lot. On the same level, interpret Scripture with Scripture. Scripture always agrees with other Scripture. It's in a massive miracle of God that I'm not sure that we always fully comprehend the number of authors, the amount of years that have gone by as Scripture was built, and there's nothing that disagrees with anything else because it is God-breathed. It's inerrant. It's God's Word. That's a, an amazing feat that only God himself could do. But it gives us this nice little context where when we find that this doesn't agree with that, that tells me one of these two, or both of them, I've got wrong. And that's really useful. Because sometimes I go through there and I think something means something else, and then I see something that conflicts. I, ah, I'm glad, glad I found through Scripture that I'm wrong. I'm, I'm missing something here. It lets me know I've got further study. I maybe need to start asking some questions. You know, that sort of a thing. Jesus demonstrated this when he was uh, tempted by Satan, this uh, importance. Um, we see this back in, uh, in Matthew. It says, uh, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. What should really, really blow everybody's mind is Satan is quoting God's word. He's quoting scripture here. This is out of Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. He's quoting scripture. He's not even changing the words. He's actually quoting scripture. But he's quoting it out of context, isn't he? We can see that. Because Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So Satan quotes scripture. He quotes it out of context. And what happens? Jesus says, nope, that's out of context. The context is this other scripture over here says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You're misusing that scripture. You're using that truth wrong. You've ruined it. Big difference. Satan takes something that's completely a literal, uh, a literal quote, and, and the way he uses it is flat out wrong and mis misleading. Satan shows his hand with the way he deals with Jesus. Uh, he, he, he tries to go kind of sneaky around the corners because remember when Jesus is being tempted, he's being tempted, right? He has needs and Satan is trying to get him to use his emotions to fulfill those needs. So number five on this list is without emotion. When we look through the scripture, every single last one of us is going to encounter a verse that we don't like. There's some hard things. When scripture tells me that I will go through troubled times, I don't like that. I really wish I could take that and make a different interpretation out of it and make it say that God is going to make sure that I'm always comfortable my whole entire life. But if I let my emotions get in the way, I'm going to ruin that truth for myself. See, Satan was trying to appeal uh, to emotion when he was speaking to Adam and Eve in the garden. When he was speaking to Eve specifically, remember he says, did God really say, he plants a little bit of a seed of doubt there. He got Eve to question the word of God. So right off, God gave her instruction, and he says, well, let's take a closer look at that. And then he drops this on her. He says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is he appealing to? Wouldn't, wouldn't any of you like to be more like God? Wouldn't you like to be more powerful, more amazing like God, that's something that no doubt Eve would have wanted. You know, that's, that's an emotional uh, appeal here. And so she fell. What about us? You ever run into any particular part of scripture that somebody can kind of reason you out of? That you toss that aside because you really, really, really want it? There have been a lot of uh, Christian counselors that go through um, before and after divorce counseling as a really good example, because that's one of those that, uh, boy, anything stirs up emotion, that's gotta be one of the top, right? There's places of hurt, there's places of lust, all of that filled in with various different divorces for different unbiblical reasons. And these counselors will get some, some really interesting reasoning. One of them is, God will forgive me, 
I can do it now and then ask for forgiveness later, right? Kind of makes sense. You see that in scripture that oh, God will forgive me, but is, is that really what God wants? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's uh, very safe at all, but I could see where you'd want to twist it and make it, make it seem like that. Like that's perfectly okay to, to commit that sin because I really want it, really need it, and then he'll forgive me afterwards. Another one is, um, you know, they'll say, oh, my significant other committed spiritual adultery. They weren't, they weren't there for me when I needed them. They didn't provide for me in the way that the scripture says they're, they're to provide. And so it's kind of like adultery, and adultery is a reason for divorce, right? You're playing with some words there. I'd, I'd struggle to find anything in scripture that would allow you to make those kinds of uh, relations. Um, and then I, I've even heard this from, from some people in the past say, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have been married to begin with. I was violating what God wanted for me when I got married. And so, you know, I'm just making it right. These exceptions aren't in scripture. They're not in there anywhere. And they're, they're a, a, an indication for anybody that would say these things is that this is a hurting person or this is a person that has some, some very emotional motivation. And the best counsel they receive is you need to take the motivation out of it and go with a black and white because that's what matters and that's what we need to fo focus on. So all of those excuses are just, they're really poor arguments when we break them down. Uh, you know, not being in the middle of it, it's easy for us to see because we don't have that emotional connection. We can see that they're really bad arguments. They're uh, fueled by emotion uh, and none of them hold biblical ground. So to recap on these five items, how do we understand the Bible? Step one, we always ask direction from the Holy Spirit. He is the holder of truth. Let's talk to the author of truth first before we go anywhere else because he gave us our word, it's written down, let's ask him, Lord, what was your intention? What are you trying to do with this? What are you trying to accomplish? How can I use this in my life? And then I'll read through it and try to understand and he'll hold my hand and walk me through it. That is amazing. That is really amazing. Number two, look at the context because words have different meanings in different times. You need to check your culture and figure out what did that mean back then. We've got words nowadays, for example, that mean something completely different. If I, uh, if I were to stand up here and say I had a gay time last night in the 1950s, everybody would be very happy for me. If I do that now, you're all going to wonder what is wrong with me and I'm probably not going to be up here again. The word means something different now. Same word. We need to be aware of that context. We need to be aware of the cultural context. What was the word? What was the sentence? What was the, uh, the footnotes in your Bible is going to be really, really useful because a lot of very intelligent people have gone and done a lot of this footwork for you because this is uh, so important. Uh, number three, scripture is always true. Use those commentaries, use those footnotes, but bear in mind if the commentary says something different than what scripture says, you have to take scripture, throw the commentary out. It doesn't matter how intelligent the person who wrote it is, how well respected they are, how godly they appear. If it's in conflict with scripture, scripture is always correct. Number four, interpret scripture with scripture. We know that it is all true all the way through. There aren't contradictions in the Bible, so when you find them, it's a nice indicator to you that you need to study further. And you can learn some really neat, amazing things when you encounter those. Don't ever throw your arms up and say, well, Bible contradicts itself, because it doesn't. But start asking the questions, doing the research, and figure out, what am I getting wrong on that? And then, lastly, we, our, our reasoning adjusts throughout the day. If I haven't had caffeine, I'm not going to be terribly reasonable. I'm going to be kind of snippy and, you know, maybe kind of mean from time to time. My emotions can kind of get hold and change the way that I logic. So uh, be aware of that. Be, be aware of what are your motivations for taking scripture in a particular way and could those be getting in the way. And then here's a freebie. Be silent when scripture is silent. We're dealing with the truth here. This is so important. You don't want to change it. If you don't know, that's okay. It's always okay. It's okay to say, I don't know if somebody's asking you something. I do it a lot. You guys know that. You ask me something that's a, you know, really stumped me. I wasn't prepared for it. I hadn't studied it out. Mm, can I get back to you? Because I'm going to need to do some research because I don't ever want to speak where scripture doesn't speak or say something scripture doesn't say. It's precious. The truth is precious. Jesus said, I am the truth, right? 
it's precious and needs to be treated with respect. We don't want to add to it. We don't want to soften it even. If scripture says this is the way something is, don't try to figure out how you can soften that blow. This is what scripture says. We're just the messengers. We don't need to soften scripture. Just let it stand on its own. So with that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and end in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for, for your word, how amazing it is that, uh, that we can understand the one true God share with us. Lord, we don't ever want to take it out of context. We don't ever want to take your word to mean something that you did not intend it to mean. So we pray that you help us to have our eyes open, that when we approach scripture, we do it out of respect first and foremost that we never let scripture prove our motivations, but instead we let scripture show us your motivations, Lord, that we learn more about you through it, that we learn more about what it is that you have in store for us, what it is you want us to do. Lord, we just ask that you uh, continually watch over us, help us to reach these new understandings time and time again. And Lord, most importantly, we thank you so much for loving us so much that you would do that for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Nick. We um, have a new song that we want to introduce to you guys today. And it's cool, the first verse actually talks about how God's word is a sword, it's a light for our path and a, a lamp for our feet. The, um, the chorus, so that you guys can sing along with us, the chorus is, um, well, let me back up. The song is speaking about, the song is called All We Have. And it's speaking of um, how that all we have to give is all of ourselves to the Lord. That's what we owe the Lord is all of us. But also the song speaks of all we have that the Lord has given. To and the chorus is um, the first time we sing it, it's I. It's all I owe to you is all I have to give. For all you gave to me is all I need to live. And then every other time we sing the chorus after that, it's we. Um, All we owe to you is all we have to give, for all you gave to us is all we need to live. So if you'd like to stand, please feel free. Oh. 
song for you today.
things we have going on around here. Um, we have the discipleship class that happens uh, after churches on Sundays, and we also have our Wednesday night services. If, uh, if the Lord's spoken to your heart in any way to get any deeper understanding in his word, those are two really good places. They're small groups. We do various different studies, and most importantly, everybody has the opportunity to ask questions and discuss. It's a really, really good format, so I would strongly encourage you, if you haven't gone before, Give it a try. It's kind of a burden. Everybody has trouble getting in on Wednesday nights, that sort of a thing, with all the week going on. But if you're able to, I would strongly recommend give it a try and then just see how the Lord blesses you. Everybody have a really good weekend.